Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this week, four of us are sharing books that we love to read again and again. As we're sharing these books, the covers and titles and the various formats that are available in will appear on your screen. If you'd like to get your hands on any of them, the quickest way is probably to call your local branch of the Monroe County Library System and speak to one of the librarians there, and they will be more than happy to assist you in getting your hands on these books. If you'd like to do it yourself, you can go straight to our online catalog to request physical versions, hardcover, paperback, CD audios, and large print. Or if you'd like a digital copy, some of the titles will show that they're available on one of our two digital platforms. We offer Overdrive, which you may also hear referred to as Libby, which is the name of the app if you go into your app store. And Overdrive offers downloadable ebooks and downloadable audiobooks. And we also offer Hoopla, which offers downloadable ebooks, downloadable audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And the fabulous thing about Hoopla is that there is never a wait for any of the items that you see on that platform. And now we're going to introduce ourselves. I'm Jennifer Grineski. I am the community librarian at the Dundee Branch Library. And our introductory question this week is, since we're talking about books we love to read again and again, what is an activity that you could do over and over and never grow tired of? And I thought about this one and I think what it would be for me is I like walking trails, not hiking, I don't want really difficult trails, just a little up and a little down. And in particular, about a year and a half ago, my son and I went to Hidden Lake Gardens out near Tipton in Lenawee County for the very first time. And we started walking the trails there. And I am not a nature person. I am not a sporty person, but I just love it. The trails there are usually very, very quiet. There aren't a lot of other people around. Um, I love going into the different seasons, seeing it in spring, seeing it in summer. Um, I love the fall. Fall is my favorite. And even winter, I went once in winter and they clear the paths and you can go out there. And because of all the trees, it's really a wooded area. And I just love it. I could just walk and walk. I could go there every day. I wish we lived a little bit closer. We're about 20 minutes away. And our family decided this week that we are going to be adopting a shelter dog this weekend. And one of the first things that I thought of was, oh, we can take the dog to Hidden Lake Gardens. And I'm so excited to take the dog to Hidden Lake Gardens and like show it off to the dog, like look nature, <laughs> you know? And we have a nice fenced in yard as well, but I'm just like new things for you to sniff. So I think that's my thing that I would do over and over. And I do wish that I lived a little closer so that I could go there more often than just once or twice a month. So that's mine. Also with us this week, we have Kristen Brown, who is a reference librarian at the Bedford Branch Library. And what activity would you, would you enjoy doing over and over again, Kristen? So mine is probably gonna seem a little strange. And right now I love doing it over and over. I've been doing it for like a year now, so hopefully I'll continue to like it. Maybe later on in life I won't as much, but mine is mine is weightlifting. So oh. I like to do weight training. Um, and so I basically all you're doing is picking up things and putting them down, which is <laughs> fine. But um, I just really like the fact that there's, you know, like you can kind of manipulate your body and it's really helped me to learn of how our bodies work and the food that you eat and I've, I've just had a really good experience with it so I enjoy doing that. That is awesome and it's and it's good for you for like forever like you know they tell right, so everybody I'm, like you should be weight I'm you know resistance it, training of some sort so good for you. Thank you Kristen. Also with us this week, we have Jen McCarty, who is a reference librarian at our Ellis Library. And what activity do you enjoy repeating over and over again, Jen? Well, I don't get to do it as frequently as I would like to, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I love visiting Disney World, um, particularly at the Christmas season. It's one of the reasons I picked that picture, but um, it's just I didn't get to go there. I never went there as a child. I didn't go there for the first time until I was an adult. 
Um, and my kids have no idea how incredibly spoiled they are that they've been three times already and they're, you know, three, nine and seven. Um, but it's just, I love that feeling of just, feel, you feel like a kid. There's so much magic. Um, it, it totally transports you to an entirely new, you know, new place. And like, I know there are people that don't like it. There are people that are like, oh, it's crowded and uh, it's expensive. And it is all of those things. But I just find, I just find the magic. I love, I love, 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 love Disney World. Um, someday I'd love to go to Disneyland, but Disney, I could go to Disney couple times a year if we lived a little closer and it would never get old for me. I agree. Jen already knows this. I'm also a huge yeah. Disney fan and our family has also been at least three times. I'm not sure exactly how many and it's just it's I don't know. I don't know if it's the nostalgia factor if you just feel completely a world away from your regular life but I agree. There's something about it. Not for everyone but for those of us I who love, love it. it we would do it every day if we could. Me too. Thank you, Jen. And also with us this week, we have Jody Russ, who is the community librarian at the Bedford branch. And what activity would you do over and over again, Jody? Um, I thought of all kinds of lame stuff. You guys have exciting things you would do over and over again. Um, I like coloring. I like gardening. I really love playing in the dirt. I mean, that's just one of the things I like to do. Um, my my mom has a cottage up on Lake Vineyard, so like that's my favorite place on earth. So just going up there and I'm I'm one of the old people who sits on the beach and just watches the water now as opposed to really getting out in it. But it's it's lovely and relaxing and so mostly those kinds of things. Relaxation, some sort of relaxation. Good I thing feeling you'd say something with gardening. <laughs> yeah, I know you like your gardening. I do. I really do. I'm watching those squirrels now. I just I've planted 270 bulbs in my new garden bed over the last couple weeks to a month. And um, I tell you what, there's going to be some squirrel stew coming up pretty soon if I see those squirrels <laughs> sniffing around out there too much more. <laughs> we did um, like 50, I think, uh, tulip bulbs a couple of years ago. And yeah, I was like, and I don't like to garden, but I was like, don't you touch my bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> Squirrels, I normally like you, but not right now. <laughs> Although I did think about you, Jody, the last time we went to Hidden Lake Gardens because they have some amazing plant things, and I know <laughs> nothing about plants. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, here's me chugging along, going, I love nature. I don't know what that tree is. I don't know what that plant is. I don't know what that flower is. Like, I don't know any of it. I just am happy it's there and I am existing in it. But I'm glad there are people that do know. You know that's the exact point. Because so many volunteers work there and right. keep it amazing looking. Yeah, that's the whole point of Hidden Lake Gardens is to, you know, education about plants. <laughs> and here's me. No, I'm just here to walk. <laughs> bring my dog. Uh, and bring my dog. <laughs> Complete side note, I just saw your mug, Jen, and my face was like, oh, I know, so good. Oh my gosh, I love it, Jennifer. If you don't know who this is, this is a teen from Strange Planet. We do have one of the Strange Planet books available in the library system, and I actually probably could have used that for one of my books today if I had been thinking about it, because I've read it over and over and over about it. But if you need a family-friendly laugh, Strange Planet, check it out. They're available online, too. So funny. Love the beans. So I'm glad to notice that. Changed up my mug this week. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's have let's have Kristen get us started with books that you love to read over and over again. So with this topic, I knew I had to jump on this one super quick because I picked Harry Potter. And if you know a librarian, you know they love Harry Potter most of the time. Um, especially Jody, because I know Jody loves Harry Potter. <laughs> But I, so I chose the first one, but um, I just was talking about this. It's kind of just talk about the first Harry Potter because if you read one, it's hard not to read the other ones. Um, so Harry Potter has everything that you would want in just like a feel good comfort book, right? So you have like this amazing friendship. You have a main character who starts off in the bottom and then 
kind of like the the bad characters of the book kind of get what's coming to them. You have this fight of good versus evil and um, JK Rowling just does a great job with developing her characters so that you really form these relationships with them. And I think I most um, connect with the Sorcerer's Stone because I do have vivid memories of my um, <clears throat> fourth grade teacher reading this aloud to us and she was super awesome. I didn't have her for a teacher for a long time, but I just she she's one of those teachers that sticks out in my head. So the story follows Harry Potter. He lives with his um, aunt and uncle and his cousin who are pretty much horrible people. All they care about is themselves, how society thinks of them. They're very hoity-toity um, and they have some crazy names. So Vernon, Petunia, and uh, Dudley. And they just treat Harry horrible. They, they took in Harry, he was an orphan, got dropped off on their doorstep, and they pretty much just hold that against him every day of his life. Like he walked there and was like, hey, take care of me. So he sleeps in, um, in the bed under the stairs and he has to wear all of uh, Dudley's old clothes and you just get this picture that like and but the thing with Harry is he's such a unique character because he doesn't he doesn't really lash out he's kind of calm about it um, you know obviously he's being treated bad but he doesn't he doesn't resent anybody he's not a super angry person um, and then this incredible thing happens, or over time he kind of sees these little things that happen, but this big incident happens at the zoo and he realizes that there's something different about him. Some weird things are happening. And um, after this incident happens, he ends up having to leave the house where they are. His aunt and uncle take him away to this hidden, I don't know, it was like a shack in the middle of nowhere. And Harry doesn't understand why they're doing this. There's some reason why his aunt and uncle have, have taken him away. They're really scared for some reason. And then in comes Hagrid. And Hagrid tells Harry, listen, you're a wizard, all right? Like there's this school, Hogwarts, and you're gonna go to it. Um, and then you find out kind of the reason why his aunt and uncle were so against him uh, finding out anything about that side of the family. Um, but from here, it's just like this bottle that opens up and you just get submerged into the world of Harry Potter. And so Hagrid sets him up with everything he needs to go to Hogwarts. Um, they go to Diagon Alley, which is one of my favorite things about this book because it's really diagonally. And then she references that in another book. But anyways, segue. <laughs> um, so he finds out that he has parents and his parents were really great people and they were also really famous and pretty well off. Um, the reason why they were famous was not a good reason. Um, it was because they were murdered by uh, this really dark, powerful wizard named Voldemort. And he is so dangerous that nobody even says his name, right? I saw your mouth open like, well, you said it. He who must not be named. Um, and so that's where the good versus evil comes in because Harry um, bodies the Gryffindor house, right? Uh, he becomes like a Gryffindor and he's he's noble and he does what's right and he's a great friend. Um, he meets Ron and Hermione who they form this incredible relationship, this really unique trio. Um, and so I could go on and on about it, but basically it's just a really great book that talks about, it has a lot to do with with emotions and and you know that whole good versus evil as the books go on and we were just kind of discussing this before um while we were waiting for everyone else to join too um jen you and i were discussing how i mean it gradually kind of gets a little bit darker that voldemort um you start getting really the idea of who voldemort is and how all of this happened and how harry has ties to him and so it's a really great book that that everybody can read so you can read it when you're young when you're older and you kind of grow with the books you grow with harry as he matures through his life and starts to understand about his history and his past um and so it's just it's heartwarming it's great it's a beautiful book i think the books definitely do age with harry like the first yes. one is is solidly he's 11. it's solidly in that juvenile and then they get darker and older and more mature yeah. and there's more themes that come in and oh Right, and there's a lot of themes that relate to that age group. So Harry goes through, you know, it's Harry goes through, um, you know, like relationships with girls and having crushes and yeah. 
you know, and then, you know, things like that. So it's it was nice the way that she set that up so you could kind of grow with Harry. And I vividly remember reading that last book and like bawling my eyes out and just having this pit in my stomach. And I think we've talked about this before when you finish a series and then you're like, what am I going to do with my life? Like, <laughs> there's no more. <laughs> so, you just go back and you read it again. Yeah, so then you just start over. That's what you do. Um, and you listen to it second. and yeah, yeah. You, you buy the different versions and right then you move on to the illustrated yeah then you listen to it on audiobook with Jim Dale yeah so that's what you do next um five so times the five next times. book five times. <laughs> five times yeah the whole series the whole series five, five times but the great okay. thing about that too is you could jump around like sometimes I'll get on Libby and just see what's available. And if number five is available, I'm like, cool, I'll just read number five for now. And I've then never, see what's I've available. I've never seen one available ever. I've always had to get on a waiting list whenever I've wanted one of those. And the Sorcerer's Stone, I just saw Overdrive's um, statistics. The Sorcerer's Stone was the number one juvenile audiobook of 2020. Nice. Which is interesting because it's from what, 1990? What, what year was that first published? 1996 or seven, seven? six or seven. I was gonna say, I, I know my son was a babe still pretty much. So, yeah, I wonder why it's so well. I wonder if it had well, wasn't it? it, wasn't had it a available? They, did it free, they did it freely did, available for yeah, a while, so that's part of it. Yeah, oh, but it got everybody stuck on them. I had, I mean, I've waited as long as eight months recently. This last time that I just finished listening to him, I waited eight months for individual titles because that's just how many people still want to listen to him. So they crazy. just did a podcast too where the uh, cast from the movies oh, yeah, read, read it. excerpts from oh, the book. Yeah, they did that during lockdown. Now that you yeah. think that. Yeah, and they kept that's releasing them. That was really neat. That was neat. They're just, they're just such like you just kind of fall into that world and you can read them for so many different reasons. You know, yeah. as a kid, you're just reading it for the adventure and the cool magic and you wish you had magic. Right. And then like, as an adult, the you're seeing those children and those teachers in such a different light. Um, and rereading them always opens up something that you didn't see the first time. Like I, my son has, I'd have to ask him how many times he's read the whole series, but we got him his own copy of it. And the first time I read them with him, and then once he got his own copy, he's reread them, I don't know how many times. And as he's getting older, different things are more important to him. And he'll talk about different things in the book. So I just, they're just, you just sink into that world. She you did a great job building. Yeah. All right, Harry Potter, two thumbs up. Also, have to ask the obligatory question since I think we're all Harry Potter fans here. Is what house are you? <laughs> Slytherin. I think I'm actually. Um, I'm a Ravenclaw. I think I'm a Hufflepuff. Ravenclaw. Is one Slytherin. Slytherin. Are you a Ravenclaw, Kristen? You could. I could see you I as. I don't a know. Maybe I'm a Raven. I don't know. I'm a Hufflepuff. You, need, you haven't taken the test on Pottermore, and you got to talk about Harry Potter. It was a really long time <laughs> ago. You're done. But I, I was like, this isn't Gryffindor, so I don't really want to be. A part my of my my household is is divided. Um, <laughs> my husband think wants to be a Slytherin, but he's not. He's not at all. He's a Gryffindor. Um, my oldest is a Hufflepuff, and he's a proud puff. My youngest wants to be a Gryffindor, and he's not. He's a Slytherin, one hundred percent. My son is also a proud puff. Yeah, and my husband is a Gryffindor. Yeah, so Brian is not, a proud, uh, a proud. If they had a fourth one, maybe they would be a, a Ravenclaw. Maybe yeah. the adopted dog is going to be the the Ravenclaw. <laughs> <laughs> family. Full circle. That's right. All right, and your <laughs> other book, Kristen. Um, so the other one is is. It fits in with the time of the year, um, which is probably why I chose this one because I, I literally read this every year and I think I read it at least three or four times during the Christmas season, if not more, um, because it's a relatively short book. I also really love listening to it on audiobook, um, so check that out for sure. The thing that I love about this book is it's a classic. Everybody knows about it, but I think everybody knows about the video versions like the movies instead of the actual Charles Dickens. And it is funny. 
and I did not expect it to be funny when I first read it. I was like, this is going to be a really serious book about these ghosts. And I mean, that's how the movies usually are. There's, I mean, but like, it's funny. There's so many like little ones, even the way that he opens it up about being dead as a doornail and how like, how dead can a doornail be? And just like crazy things that he does. It's beautifully written um, and it's super vivid in details. And I just, I just enjoy the writing of it. It's just a beautiful story. The way that he talks about, um, you know, each ghost coming. And um, I think my favorite part though, is the part where the nephew comes and talks to um, Ebenezer. And even though Ebenezer is horrible and is just telling him like, why'd you get married? I don't understand why you're so happy you're not rich. I don't understand why you're so jolly right now. Like it's Christmas, who cares about Christmas? And his nephew is still like, well, I'm still going to wish you Merry Christmas anyway, because that's that's what we do in the Christmas season. So I really enjoyed his character. Um, my new favorite thing to do now is to watch the movie The Man Who Invented Christmas with Dan Stevens, if any of you have seen that before. Um, that's my new favorite thing to do because it talks about the story of the Christmas Carol, but it's also biographic and then it talks about his own life and um, to a certain extent, I mean, it is fictionalized, but it also talks about his process and how he wrote the books because he wrote them in such a, I think it took him four weeks from like the time he started it to when it got printed um, because he wanted it to be a Christmas book. And um, it just really stresses the fact that during that time, Christmas was not really a big deal. It wasn't something that people celebrated in the way they do now. Um, and so I personally like it because of the ties to Charles Dickens. I think he's a fascinating person and also just the beautiful writing, so. Everybody's favorite um, video version of Christmas Carol. I like the George C. Scott version. <laughs> I'm a juvenile, so. <laughs> Mine is a toss up between Mickey's Christmas Carol and the Muppets Christmas Carol. <laughs> the Muppets one is pretty awesome. They're, they're both they're both great, but yeah, I, I'm a child, so those are my choices. <laughs> I'm a child, so. I pre I preferred Scrooge with uh. Oh, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> Bill Murray. No, yeah, Bill Murray. Awesome, yeah. That one. yeah, I What's thought that. What's the one with the um? She's the ghost of Christmas past, where she keeps bopping them on the head. Is that the one I'm thinking of? I don't remember, because it's really hard to find that movie, so I haven't watched it in a long time. I oh, need to yeah. look for I don't know I who the actress is that plays that. There but. is one with Carol Kane, um, plays one of the ghosts, and I can't even remember what version she's in. I don't know who that is. But the I one think. she has like that really high-pitched voice, and she's always like, yeah, and then she like. That, that's got to that's Carol Kane. That's Carol Kane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think Jim Carrey did a really good job in the version that he did. Like, I think, you know, to make something, yeah. to go from something as old as that story is to make it more appealing for current day, I think that did a really good job of it. But some of the older versions are pretty cool to watch too, so. Well, and I think with Jim Carrey, he did all the voices of all the ghosts, right? Yeah, didn't they do, isn't that one like the Polar Express kind of like stop motion, or not stop motion, but like the motion capture? Isn't that so, one like the CGI something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't think um, I've seen that. Ebenezer one. looks like him. Yeah, which I don't care for. Those creep me out. <laughs> like Polar yeah, Express, my kids like love it. Girl. No, yeah. it's weird. <laughs> Stop being weird and creepy. Motion capture Tom Hanks. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I don't. I don't care for it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And let's have Jen share her books that she loves to read again and again next. Okay, so my first one, the Percy Jackson series by Rick Reardon, and I picked these because um, the first book is The Lightning Thief. Um, I read them first, and then I made my husband, I believe we listened to them all together, and he's not a huge reader. He's like a, you know, short newspaper kind of reader. He doesn't read a whole lot of fiction, and he loved them. And then I think we've listened to them more than once. Like for a while, um, we have family in a lot of other states. So we would travel and we would just get audiobooks and we'd listen to them in the car. And like we read, we did all the Percy's that way. And it's ones that like we both know we enjoyed. So we've done them more than once. And the audios are good. 
Um, and now my kids have read them. We've read them together as a family. So these are books that I've came back to at different stages and they're just so good. So if you're not familiar with the Percy Jackson series, Percy is, it's a kind of Harry Potter-esque really. He's a young kid. He, he's kind of troubled. Um, he's always been in trouble at school. He's constantly getting kicked out of schools because he, things happen and he, he's not a bad kid, but like trouble happens and he's always in the center of it so he gets in trouble even though he didn't necessarily maybe cause whatever it is but he's um about to get kicked out of another school and he discovers that he's actually a demigod his son is one of or his son his father is one of the greek gods um, initially he doesn't know who his father is but he knows that his father is one of the greek gods and that's why all these things happen to him because the Greek monsters want him out of the way. So to train for his life as a demigod, he goes to Camp Half-Blood, which is um, run by Dionysus, who's the god of wine, and he's there for punishment. And um, Percy's mentor is Chiron, who's a centaur. You know, and the first time he finds that out, like, oh, uh, wait, what? <laughs> you, you, you. Um, his best friend is a satyr, and then there's another friend. It's like I said, it's very Harry Potter asking that it's Percy and a male friend and a girlfriend. His friend, his other friend is, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on her name, Annabeth, and she's the daughter of Athena. But I love these books because there's tons of action. Um, of course, he's got to try, you know, he's got to go on this giant quest, but there's all this really cool Greek mythology also brought into the modern age. And so I love these books because they're fun, but there's also like my my oldest son's like one of his favorite books right now is a is a Greek mythology book. It's like weird, weird but true Greek mythology. Um, and so reading Percy really got him hooked on the Greek myths, which just opens up a whole you know slew of things to discover. Um, so I I love this series. I've came back to it multiple times since it's been out, and uh, and I also enjoy that Reardon has done other myths like he's done um he's done the roman equivalent of a lot of the greek stuff he's done um the, some of the egyptian stuff now he's working with some other authors to do other things like other branching out into other sort of mythologies so you just rick rudin is one of my favorite authors i love all the stuff he's done but percy so good and it's if you're a harry potter fan and you haven't read percy jackson do it because you will love them Maybe not quite as much as as Harry, but close. You'll you'll want to get a Camp Half Blood T-shirt when you're done. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my first book. Um, my second one. If you have been watching or listening to our Ray Libations, you have heard me talk about this before, but I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Butcher's Dresden Files. Um, the first book is Stormfront. Jim. Uh, Harry Dresden is another great Harry. <laughs> Harry Dresden is a wizard. He's the only wizard in the phone book. Um, he's basically like a PI who also happens to be a wizard. So the first book follows him and Karen Murphy, who is a police officer in the Chicago Special Investigations Unit. They handle all the weird stuff and she um, has Harry consult for her because he knows weird, he's a wizard. Um, the first book is really kind of classic mystery. Some people are murdered. The circumstances are pretty grisly and not a person couldn't have done this. So um, I love, love, love this series. I just recently read all of them. There's like 15 books. I just reread them all. I've read Stormfront probably five or six times. Um, there was a TV show on sci-fi based on this that wasn't great, but I watched it um <laughs> that's loyalty <laughs> yeah i i just i just love here i just love harry dresden as a character i love this series um i just recently found out that the books are narrated by james and i always say his name wrong james marsters i think i got it right who was spike from buffy the vampire slayer so i haven't listened to them yet but it's on my to-do list because i love the books and i i, I like spike so i just this is one of my favorite series. If you like supernatural fiction, if you like kind of noir, especially the first few books are definitely more of that noir mystery kind of feel. 
that happens to have magic. So one of my favorite series, I can read these over and over and over again, and, and I enjoy them every time. Nice, thank you, Jen. And let's have Jody share her books that she loves to read again and again. Okay, so I have three titles on my list today, but one of real briefly about um, the first one that I've got on the list there. I got to pull up my notes, so forgive me for a second. Okay, the first one on my list there is The Killer Angels by Michael Shara. Um, it's originally published in 1974. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, it's the story of the Battle of Gettysburg during the American Civil War, and it's what the movie Gettysburg that Jeff Daniels and Martin Sheen are in. Um, it, that's what that movie is based on, is that book. Um, it, it's such a deep story about all the players involved in the battle, and of course it's it's fictionalized because, you know, they can't honestly know all the details of what everybody said and what everybody did. But Michael Shara did an amazing amount of research um, looking at, you know, that was back in the age when people wrote things all the time, you know, kept daily diaries and wrote letters and all kinds of things. So he did an amazing amount of research to write this story. Um, it really delves into the personalities and the inner conflict of all the key people involved. I'm a sucker for history anyway, um, and it, but it's such a sweeping story. Like it's just, it, it, to me, it's really moving. I was able to visit the battlefield at Gettysburg and do the whole tour with reenactments going on and everything. And when you see how beautiful that area is and that land is, and to think about the devastation that happened there, um, in, mul in a multiple day battle. It's just so very moving. It's very, um, it's like, it's like peaceful, but not at the same time. It's just really, uh, I get a really interesting feel when I was there. Um, and then because writing this book really consumed Michael Shara's life, this was the only book that he published. His son, Jeff, set to writing the rest of the story of the Civil War, as well as other stories on all kinds of other American conflicts. I saw an interview with Jeff once that said, this was all he knew growing up because it was so important to his father, the Battle of Gettysburg. Like this was, that was it. That was what their life was about. Um, so it seemed only natural to him that writing more about that is what should be his life's work too. So, and he writes really good stories too. I, I mean, The Killer Angels is better than, um, better than the other stories, I think, but that's just my personal opinion. That's just um, how it came across to me. It's been a long time since I read it. Um, I've got it. I've got it reserved on audio. They have it available on audio through Melcat. We only have it in print, um, but there there are audios available throughout the state. So I did request one of those because just talking about it made me want to read it again. So I'm going to do that. Um, OK, so that was that was the first one. And then <laughs> the second one I was going to talk about is would of course been Harry Potter, although I would the third book um, because that's when he it's meets my Sirius. favorite too. Yeah, when he meets Sirius Black and he gets, you know, he has family again and he didn't, or family who cares about him, I should say. Um, yeah, that's to me, that was, that was the best of the series. Um, so since I can't talk about Harry Potter, since <laughs> Kristen already stole it, um, I decided to go with To Kill a Mockingbird, which seemed like an odd choice to me for a bit, but um, I really enjoyed picking this one up again, like later in life, you know, oftentimes so many of the books that um, people have to read either in high school or in a college literature class are so much more meaningful to you when you read them later. And you guys don't know what I'm talking about because you're not in your 50s. <laughs> but um, it really, I think To Kill a Mockingbird really speaks to you from different perspectives, depending on not only where you are in your life, but what's going on in the world around you too. So reading it now, like it really shows us how much has changed and how much hasn't changed. And so um, I just found it really interesting. I do have some notes that I'm, I, I have to pull my notes back up because I don't want to forget to say some of these things. Um, I picked it up again when, to, when Go Set a Watchman was coming out in 2015 because I felt like it had been so long since I read To Kill a Mockingbird that I didn't want to read Go Set a Watchman and not 
remember the details of To Kill a Mockingbird, but then I listened to it again when my daughter was reading it for her high school English class, which I seem to talk about a lot because um, there's so many books that I've read again or became known to me because of that. The audio is read by Sissy Spacek, and honestly, she's just the perfect reader for this story. She has that kind of childlike southern voice that helps really set the tone the character development i mean harper lee's character development in in both of those books um just you know just wonderful like you really feel like you really know those people and it um seems i mean it seems to really bring you into the book so um and again historical fiction something i always enjoy so um I found To Kill a Mockingbird interesting. We do have it on audio with Sissy Spacek reading it too. Um, Go Set a Watchman's read by Reese Witherspoon, which she is also lovely to listen to, has a really good voice for that kind of thing. So um, that was my second book. And the third one I'll just mention real quick because I just finished it for the second time was How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Um, I think both um, How to Be an Anti-Racist and Stamped from the Beginning by the same author our eye-opening reads on racism in America. Um, I've said to a lot of my colleagues, like I'm a middle-aged, middle-class white woman who's lived in Bedford Township all my life. I know nothing about racial relations and I feel really kind of ashamed of that. And so these books have been very eye-opening for me, um, has, has made me realize how much I have to learn. Um, so, and I didn't want to leave this out. I, there's so many good, I feel like it was kind of natural for us to lean towards things that are kind of borderline classics because we're librarians, right? Like that's part of what I, I mean, Harry Potter is a classic in my opinion. So, um, but I didn't want to leave out newer books because there's just so many good things out there and um, deep, meaningful things that I think it's, I think it's an important journey for people to take, so. Anyway, I thought he reads he reads both stamped from the beginning and um, how to be an anti-racist. He also has a, a YA version of stamped that Jason Reynolds reads, which Jason Reynolds is lovely to listen to. He's he's better to listen to than Ibram Kendi is, but oh, see, um, I, I love listening to Dr. Kendi. I feel well, like I can listen to him all has, the time. He has kind of a funky cadence sometimes, yes. and I know that it's because he's reading his own work and in his mind, mm -hmm. that's how he hears it. You know what I mean? But it throws me off because I'm like, Wah, it just has kind of a funky, you know. <laughs> I feel like he's so soothing, though. Like when he, he is, talks, I'm just like, yes, he okay, is. I'm in this information and I'm processing it. Like I just... And in How to Be an Anti-Racist, he tells the story of his wife getting cancer and then his mom got cancer and then he got cancer and how cancer is so much more prominent in in black Americans than it is in white Americans. And um, I mean, I'm somebody who's been involved in My dad died of cancer when he was 55 years old. So um, I've been involved in Relay for Life for s since then. Like, I feel like this is something I didn't even know that. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like something that I've been deeply involved in for many years of my life, and I didn't even know that. So, um, but like you said, he tells those stories in kind of a soothing way. I'm like, how can you be talking about you know, your wife yeah. frees an embryo so that you can potentially have children when she's battling. I mean, it's just so, it's it's moving, but you have to be in the right frame of mind. Um, you have to be willing to accept what you don't know and to be able to grow. So um, you have to be able to listen, you like really, not just hear, but really, actually listen. I'm really glad you picked that book. That's, it's a really good book. There's a lot more I could say about it, but I'll I'll stop there because that's <laughs> another topic for another day. <laughs> and the YA version of Stamped is incredible. I have started How to Be an Anti-Racist, but I am moving through it slowly. I think because there is so much that I need to learn to listen better, you know. Um, but Stamped is the YA version that Jason Reynolds did. It's a very quick read and it's very accessible. Um, and that one I am sharing with my 12 year old son um, mm -hmm. and it it's it's eye opening. Yes, I will leave it at that as well, but 
pick them up. They're fabulous books. And now my books that I love to read again and again, um, move away from the serious side and over to the utterly absurd side because the first book that I chose is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And Jody was actually contemplating picking this one and then she decided not to, so I stole it. Um, I love The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think most people, when they first read this book, is probably sometime in high school. And there's something about that um, irreverence and the quick humor and the wit that's in it. And I feel like it also has to do, like usually sometime in high school, you're also introduced to Monty Python, both the sketches and the Holy Grail. And if you are the sort of person that ends up going, oh, I really like Monty Python, which I do, um, then somebody's gonna hand you the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and you're gonna fall in love with it. So the story itself is also completely absurd. So Arthur Dent wakes up and he's having a really bad day because his house is gonna get bulldozed for a new highway. So he goes out, lays down in front of his house, is convinced he's gonna be able to save his house and his buddy Ford Prefect comes over and says, listen man, let's just go get a drink because this isn't gonna do you any good. You got bigger problems. And so Arthur's like, bigger problems? What's a bigger problem than my house getting destroyed? And then Ford explains to him that, you know, Ford's actually an alien and he works for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is a real book that they continually update. And Earth, sadly, like Arthur's house, is getting destroyed that same day to make way for an intergalactic highway. And so if Arthur would like to survive this, he needs to come immediately with Ford. And by the way, he should grab a towel because towels are useful in every situation. And thus begins the adventure of a lifetime for Arthur Dent as he is whisked away onto a spaceship because of course Ford Prefect knows to hitchhike, how to hitchhike intergalactically. So he's whisked away on the spaceship, his life is turned upside down. He meets utterly mad, crazy characters Nothing makes complete sense. And on almost every page, there's like a throwaway line of humor. It's it, it's just a wonderful book. And anytime you just need a break from the world as it is, even though Adams has kind of a dark view of the world as it is, um, this is a great way to just laugh as you read about, yeah, life can be pretty crazy and make no sense. And it's still enjoyable and funny to be a human in it. So a couple of lines from the book to give you an idea of what it's like. So there's a description of the planet Earth and one of the reasons why nobody else in the galaxy is terribly concerned that it's getting destroyed. Because, you know, it's Earth. Who cares? So this is the description from the book. This planet, referring to Earth, has or rather had a problem because at this point it's gone, which was this. Most of the people living on it were unhappy for pretty, for pretty much of the time. Many solutions were suggested for this problem, but most of these were largely concerned with the movement of small green pieces of paper, which was odd because on the whole, it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. <laughs> and I just love that description because it's like, it just points out like this life that we live is sometimes so silly and we and it is and yes you you got to take it seriously but sometimes it's okay to just go what are we doing and then this was my other this is another good one so this is going to be my last one and then i'll move on to my other book but so arthur has been whisked away onto a vogan spaceship well actually i think they're getting ready to get pushed out of this vogan spaceship but he and Ford Prefect are kind of in dire straits here. Things are not going well. They're going to get, you know, kicked off the spaceship out into outer space. You know, said Arthur, it's at times like this when I'm trapped in a Vogan airlock with a man from Beetlejuice, that's Ford Prefect, and I'm about to die of asphyxiation in deep space that I really wish I'd listened to what my mother told me when I was wrong, when I was young. Why? What did she tell you? I don't know. I didn't listen. I 
just think that's great. Because <laughs> he doesn't know what he missed because he wasn't <laughs> listening. It's been a while since I've read that, and I'm I'm really feeling like I need to revisit. Need it's, to read it's it been again. A while. Also, you know, if the dolphins ever leave Earth, that's a bad sign because <laughs> the dolphins are leaving first. And if you want the answer to the life the to life the universe and everything, it's in this book. It really is. There's an answer. I'm not going to give it away because if you haven't read it, I almost said it. But you're, I, I you're, keep it. you're anxiously it awaiting myself. in the book. The very first time you're reading it, you're like, are they really going to give an answer to the life, the universe, and everything? Yes, yes, they do. There's no cliffhanger. There's nothing ambiguous. You're going to get an answer. So I'll leave and it at that. You should. Everybody should read this book at some point if you like weird humor. At, right. one of, at one of our robotics things recently, one, some of the kids were asking question after question after question, and finally one of the other coaches blurted out the, the <laughs> universe and everything, and I like swung my head around. I'm like, what? And of course the kids didn't have any idea. That particular coach happens to be my son's age, but uh, the kids didn't know what he was talking about because they're middle schoolers, but I thought that was pretty funny that the adults in the room got they're it. All laughed. Yeah, and it's funny because it's you, you get it and you go, <laughs> oh, it makes perfect sense, even though it makes no sense. <laughs> and as soon as you hear somebody reference it, you're like, oh, you and I, we can be friends. No, <laughs> and that group, I haven't read this yet. I've only oh, seen to read the film with Martin. Maybe, maybe afterwards. Oh, we'll I don't really this. like any of the movies. There is a BBC okay, so like radio production that's book. pretty good. There is also, okay, I'm just going to get all nerded out on everybody here. <laughs> so when I was young, you know, computer games were in their infancy. And one of the types of games that started being released were text adventure games. This is literally a game with no pictures. It's just text. And you just like, so a thing will happen and you're like, jump or say hi. Like, and you can type those in. <laughs> But there were mysteries, there were science fiction ones, and there's one base on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I have played it, and it is awesome. And if you want to play this game, it is available now for free through the BBC. You can just get on and play the text adventure game from Info. I just got to see what it's like because I can just imagine all of these. I the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Infocom. It's it's amazing. Just go in and start playing it. And trust me, you're going to die. Like, because you start off and I think you're Arthur or you're somebody like alongside Arthur. It's been a while since I played it, but I think it's from Arthur's perspective. So like your house is about to get destroyed and you have to make all the right decisions to make it off the planet with Ford. And trust me, you're going to die a bunch of times. That's the other thing. Like, it's no big deal to die in these games because like part of the fun is all the silly answers that they give you to the stuff that you type in so there now i've completely nerded out you all know i <laughs> love text adventure games zork so. if you know what i mean when i say zork you and me we can hang out so yeah <laughs> you had child, child of the 80s <laughs> you had me when you said you were a monty python fan things i never knew about jennifer i think i could recite that movie word for word oh so <laughs> I'm not oh yeah man. Oh, well I feel happy. Happy. <laughs> I feel happy. Happy frost. I'm getting frost. Yeah, okay. I'll stop now. I do, I love Monty Python. I love the sketches, the department of silly walks, the parrot. Okay, I'll stop now. So my next book. On the bright side. In fact, one of the sad things, see, now I'm not gonna stop. Jody got me started. One of the sad things that happened during lockdown was that the Stratford Festival over in Canada was doing the musical, the Monty Python musical, at the Stratford oh. Festival this past season. And Mike and I had booked a, um, Airbnb and we were going to go over and see that show for the weekend. And we were booked for May. And of course, one, we can't travel to Canada and we couldn't then. And they ended up having to close their whole season, which makes me super sad. But we donated our tickets to the festival cause. Um, oh. That's but awesome. I hope, you know, maybe they'll repeat that season because I would love it. It's Spam a lot. I was trying to think of the name of the my, musical, my, Spam a lot. My brother and I went and saw Spam a lot at the Toledo um, Stranahan Center. Yeah. My, my husband always wanted to see it. And the last time it came around here, the tickets were really expensive. And I kind of 
complained about the cost and we didn't do it. And he's never let me live it down. <laughs> Remember when I wanted to see spam a lot and you wouldn't let me buy no. <laughs> I have I have my own black knight at home and all of the body parts. Yes. All that is lost. <laughs> flesh wounds. Black knight always triumphs. <laughs> Oh, good times. Good times. All right. So my <laughs> last book, which I almost feel is going to be like underwhelming now <laughs> after this. But my last book is The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie. And on a lot of lists, this is considered to be one of her best works. So in this particular one, you go to the quiet English village, because I don't know, Agatha Christie's always going to quiet English villages and killing people off. Um, but you're in King's Abbot, and King's Abbot happens to be the town where Hercule Poirot has retired to. And so one of the widows in the town, who's well known, is found dead. And she's found dead of like um, sleeping pills. And so they aren't sure if it was accidental, if it was a suicide. And then her fiance thinks that it's actually possibly murder. And so he invites all of these people over for a dinner and starts sharing his story with several of them that he trusts, that he thinks that this might possibly have been murder, that um, the widow that was killed or either was killed or committed suicide, maybe it happened because her husband had died a year previous and there were suspicions that maybe she had murdered him. And so now Roger Ackroyd, her fiance, is concerned that something happened to her because of these rumors and suspicions about her. So he invites, you know, if you've read Agatha Christie, there's always a gang of people. He invites a doctor over. He's got his sister-in-law and her daughter. He's got his personal secretary. So there's a whole gang of people at the dinner. The dinner ends. They're all kind of aware about his concerns. They all leave the house. And then he turns up dead, which you know from the title, so I'm not giving anything away, the murder of Roger Ackroyd. And then um, one of the women that was there at the dinner party knows Hercule Poirot and asks him to come in and start investigating. And I remember the first time I read this, I was blown away at the final reveal um, as, as to who did it. And the two times later that I have since read this, you would think I'd be like, OK, I know what's going on. No, I'm still blown away every time because Agatha Christie does such a good job in this book of dropping clues so it's not like the reveal comes out of nowhere. It's not an unfair reveal where you're like, well, how was I supposed to know that? There are subtle clues in there the whole time, but they're so good. And so there's enough other red herrings that you're like, I don't know how she does it. So on each rereading, I'm sitting there looking at, where is she building this in? And then you're like, oh, there it is. So every time it just, the ending sort of blows me away. Um, and Hercule Poirot is so vain and funny and pompous that he's enjoyable to read no matter what. But this is definitely one of my favorites of Agatha Christie. And I'm sure give me another four to five years when I read it again, I'll be like, oh, there it is again. Like that turning moment where you're like, oh, she's so and she's so great at that. But I think this one is by far the best example of that. So. Agatha Christie, Murder of Roger Ackroyd. If you haven't picked that one up, you should. It's fabulous on audio as well. There's a couple of different readers um, that do it in Hoopla and Overdrive. So those are our books that we love to read again and again. Um, thank you to everybody who stuck with us in this kind of <laughs> wild conversation that was super fun. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you to Jody, Kristen, and Jen for participating. And next week will be what I am calling our holiday special, because we will be sharing books that have holiday spirit next week. So we hope you come back and listen again, and we hope that you have great weeks. Bye. Bye.